Okay, well, quick, quick summary. Uh, this talk is about all the cool stuff we built for NN7. Uh, we, we want to be like the hub for alternative culture in India. I'm not going to do any plug for NN7, they just get started. Uh, this is one of the talks which is actually a bit backward from the rest of the talks I've seen all day. The rest of the talks all, all day seem to talk about here's a new thing which in technology and let's see how we can deploy it and use it. Uh, this talk goes a bit backwards because we started with NN7.n and we had a bunch of problems to fix and we went from how do you fix this problem with the best technology we can find. So it's a bit backwards. So I'll start with what were our key features which we were trying to get right and then we'll get into the code and the kind of features we went about building it. So NN7.in uh, in a nutshell has two key important features, there's content and there's music. Right? Uh, each piece has a set of important things we wanted to build around it. Content, for instance, we wanted an experience where you could browse content within the site really easily and quickly. Uh, and we wanted music to be continuously playing on the site. So if you've seen Hype Machine, if you've seen Pandora, if you've seen any big music streaming site, one of the things they do really, really well is when you're navigating through the site, the music continues to play. Right? And this is this is what I call a seamless playback. Right? So this was a really important feature for us and that is what has led to most of the stuff which we are going to show you on how we have got around building it. Okay? So key deliverables which we are trying to build, seamless navigation when you are playing music and you click on a link, music doesn't stop. We built a first version where people could pop out the player and listen to music while they could browse the site, people just absolutely hated it. Uh, no one wanted to pop out their browsers. The JavaScript involved in keeping track of your popped out browser. So I, I have built this uh, JavaScript where the browser is at the bottom, like how you see at Nemo, and when you click pop out, it pops out. And then you need to map that this browser is active at all times. So if you close this window, it had to appear back in the bottom bar. Like how Facebook chat does it, absolute nightmare to get right across browsers. It would work beautifully on Chrome and Firefox. I just wouldn't work, it would work sometimes, Opera wouldn't work at all for no for no good reason because you had to like you would create a parent and a child within the within the new frame and new window and your own window and you have to track it. So that didn't work at all for us. Lots of people it wouldn't work, there was lots of bugs, there was no way to fix it. It was a bug which we didn't know how to fix. So we said check this, we're gonna go back to a complete uh, asynchronous JavaScript based approach where every link on the site which is internal is going to be loaded in a JavaScript loop and the music is going to be in the main loop which is always, always on. So whatever you do on the site, the music doesn't stop. Right? That is, that is seamless, seamless navigation is basically you move across various lanes, the music doesn't stop. Universal playback, we've always started, I think this, we wrote the player sometime about a year and a half, two years ago, HTML5 audio was just about there. One of the biggest challenges with HTML5 audio was not getting HTML5 audio right. That is the simplest, easiest thing to do because it's audio, SRC audio and it's the simplest thing to do. The problem is what happens if there is no audio support and if you have a flash player, how do you integrate these two controls? Because I didn't want to show any flash on screen, hell no. I mean like absolutely that would not be any site I ever built. So, you had to have like an invisible flash one pixel container and everything else built in JavaScript and then you would write like a JavaScript bridge from flash and expose the same controls in flash as we do for our native audio tag. So this dot play and this dot pause and this dot rewind and this dot forward works irrespective of whether it's a flash container or an audio file. And uh, that is, those are the two thing, key things which we created for NN7 and which we will go around explaining how we built it. Uh, so, couple of, how many of you use Gizmodo? Huh? Yeah, so Gizmodo was like about the same time as we launched it, uh, did this whole attack spread thing and he'll explain on how they use a hashbang format. Uh, most of Ajax node works in a hashbang format where there's a URL and uh, if you need to add a new URL to that to load, you add a hash and a bang and then you add the rest of the path to the URL. This was basically in invented by Google because they wanted to index Ajax URLs. Okay, so just summing up everything. Okay, you want to take? 
Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Neil, and I'll be explaining uh, what we did uh, for the seamless browsing experience on NXL. Okay. So uh, he started uh, something about Hashbang UI. I'm pretty sure you guys have seen. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, I'm talking about. Uh, we have seen these yeah. URL formats. Right? So uh, this was a older format, which uh, this is a. I mean, it was a format which was used a while ago. Uh, to load Ajax content. So the thing is, there are several challenges when it comes to uh, loading Ajax content. Uh, one thing is uh, the browser location. The URL and the location bar doesn't change. You know, if you if there's a it's a challenge. How do you change the URL over there? The other problem is uh, if there's no JavaScript in the browser, what do you fall back to? What happens then? And the third challenge is how does your search engine index content which is loaded by JavaScript? Because we are essentially a music magazine. It's not a problem for let's say Twitter or something or Facebook which need not index like a content like it's not content heavy or something. But we had to index content or uh, content uh, needed to be like indexable by uh, Google and search engines. So that was also another challenge. So I'll explain how we got through all these challenges. Uh, the hash bank uh, was the initial system which was uh, started by Google. Uh, this was started because uh, basically any hash value appended at the end of the browser can be read using JavaScript. So you can write JavaScript code to pull this value and load content based on that value. So you can load content and on the page boot, when uh, you click on a URL with a hash in it, uh, you can write JavaScript to inspect the hash value and fetch the relevant content. So a uh, very popular site which does this is obviously Twitter. It uses the hash value URLs. So there are several problems with this. One is the URLs are ugly. They don't look straightforward. They are they are not like proper URLs. They don't look uh, uh, clean as such. Um, the Google has a specification for indexing this content, but it we have it. So the Google has a specification, I cannot show it to you right now. It has a specification for indexing content in hash bank URLs. But the problem is, this is only Google. Other search engines won't be able to index this content. And uh, does it matter? Yeah. Does it matter? See, the thing is, it's not about getting your content across to Google every time. The thing is, when your when your content is fetched, if, there, if suppose if there's no JavaScript, or suppose if the JavaScript breaks, the content should still be visible, right? That's the thing. So, so there's a bunch of issues with most sites you would have tried this, any link you get in Twitter, right? Click on it, it would go to twitter.com, then twitter.com would redirect you with a hash bank to the URL, even if you had a relatively straightforward URL, URL. even if you have twitter.com slash Istria slash status slash 1106, and you click on that URL in, in your browser, it would take you to twitter.com, then there would be uh, obviously some HD access rule there, which would take that URL out, put a hash bank in, and then redirect you back to the actual URL, which is how the resource allocation happens. That is really, really broken. So because A, it takes you three, thrice the amount of time it takes you to reach that link, because there is a redirect in the loop. Two, if JavaScript breaks, and it breaks quite a bit, you actually don't get to the link at all. Right? And this happens a lot. The day Gizmodo launched with this approach, where JavaScript there had an issue, and none of the, none of the site pages work. Because everything is so heavily dependent on your JavaScript being loaded, A, and being working 100%. Right? So one of our big tasks was A, to make it work without JavaScript as well, which at that point of time no one had a really clean implementation of. Uh, to make sure that the browser back button works. Again, Gmail does this really, really well with hash banks, yeah. but now they've moved to history API. Uh, but to make sure every time you hit back, the same thing you expect happened. You go back to the last page. And that needs to happen without your music pausing. Okay. So every browser control is actually in JavaScript. Right. So uh, yeah. So like I was saying, it's not just about getting the search engine to index the content. The thing is, if JavaScript breaks, at the very least, you should be able to see the content on the page. That's also a problem. Uh, the other thing which he again mentioned was, when you're fetching the page, your page request completes. Why should your browser make another? request just to fetch the content again. 
It's like multiple requests just to fetch the content. Right. So that's inefficient. And uh, third is obviously breaking the back button. So there was this while ago. Uh, you have these, uh, just as an anecdote, I'll give it to you. Uh, there is this very popular link sharing site called Reddit. Yeah. So there was this outcry about people posting Twitter links and sharing Twitter links. Because what happens is if anyone clicks on a Twitter link and then you try to go back to Reddit, it doesn't work. What happens is it completely breaks your history. It goes over there, then it redirects another friend somewhere else. And the back button doesn't work. I think they have fixed this now using some other hack. But this was a very big problem with them before. Okay. So uh, there are other ways. I mean, these are not all disadvantages. I mean, these are not all like fixed disadvantages of hashback URLs. Like, uh, for example, the back button is fixable in hashback nowadays. They have discovered a way to redirect it and get it to work. But uh, like uh, the indexing thing and uh, the Ajax loads and all, these are still problems with the hash bank developments. So uh, HTML5 uh, introduced a new uh, sort of specification which allow you to modify your history, your Windows history. So there was always an uh, object called a window.history object which allows you to just navigate forward and go back in history. So, uh, but HTML5 added three new functions to it called push date, replay state and on pop state which is not a function, sorry it's an event. So uh, what push date does is it adds a new event, it adds a new, uh, not event, it adds a new item in the history stack and it pushes it to that event, uh, that uh, position in the stack. So well, what it basically does is it just changes the URL and it, change, it introduces a new history state. So and uh, replay state what it does is instead of pushing a new item it just replaces the current item in the stack. So, at the on pop state event is called every time you press the browser is forward or back button. So, using these three functions, you are able to completely like customize your uh, JavaScript code experience. And uh, I have some code with me, but I have to show it on my. A simple demo. Should we show you the code first? There's a little bit of PHP code here and then it will help me out over here. Uh, so basically, I'll explain some of the things I've done over here. I'll uh, start out from here. So basically, first, firstly, the thing is, uh, all the clicks need to be uh, handled using JavaScript. So initially, uh, they won't work with a normal uh, this thing. So uh, I have a bunch of exceptions over here, which is like uh, if the click has a class no AJAX, then you know don't handle it using JavaScript. And uh, what I do over here is, if I check, if I check if the click the domain of the click has the same domain as the site you are using. If it's an external link, you just open it in a new window. Or uh, if you are handling the click using your control key or your meta key or you are using your middle mouse button, just open it in a new window. These are all exceptions. You don't need to use JavaScript load in these instances. Otherwise, 
or if the target is blank, you again open it in the new window. Otherwise, what you have to do is uh, I call the hand click function over here. So I have written a fallback to the normal hash bank URLs also over here. In case HTML5 is not supported, HTML5 history is not supported. So the way to check if HTML5 history is supported is to check if the push state function exists. That is the simplest and the easiest way to check it. Uh, you create a state object which stores the current URL in the and you push the object into the stack. That's all you do. Otherwise, uh, I'll explain this part later. The other plugin we have over here, and there is a load content function. You're washing the current URL. Yeah, the current URL. No, actually, just give me a second. No, I'm uh, pushing the URL to be loaded into the stack. So the new state will have the URL of the present of the state. Right. Yeah. And uh, the load content function basically what it does is it just it just fetches the content using AJAX. Uh, it finds one div inside your body and it just inserts the content inside that div. Okay. okay. So, but uh, there was there are one or two problems with this. First of all, the URLs are always the same. I mean. It's like if your page has a header or a footer or something, you cannot fetch the entire page and use it inside the page again. So what I do is I just pass a special argument called JS to it, and in these pages, I uh, check. I in the header itself, I check if the argument is set. If it's set, then I just exclude the header. I don't include the header again. So it's like a simple hack to prevent the content from loading again. And uh, down here, I just have the main container div. We just, which is there to display the content. So, I have a simple demo over here. So, I'm just loading the index page over here, and I can show you the network tab in uh, Chrome Inspector. So, now I'm loading another page. It's like it's not fetching a new page again. It's just fetching the content for page one using AJAX, and you can see from the response tab that it has only got the internal content, not the entire HTML page. So it just fetches that content and puts it inside this div over here, which is the div to display the content. So it's the same thing with other pages, and if you go back, you can just go back. I, I didn't explain the on pop state part. I'm sorry. So on pop state event is called every time you press your browser's forward or back button. So what it does is the it, it has an argument, the event handler, that will contain the state which you pushed to your uh, push state uh, function. So uh, that will uh, I have stored the location over there. So I just use that location to load the content again based on your uh, forward or back button. Like you know if you it's like you go down the stack or you go up the stack, the new state get popped out. So you just examine the URL of the new stack, uh, state over there and you just load that one. And uh, this is another thing I've done. Each page. Oh, yeah. This browser not supported the history uh, API. Then, yeah. would it, then it would fall back on hash times. Uh, I'll explain how it does that after I complete this. So, and another thing which I've implemented is. Yeah. This you are getting Yeah. So it's not cacheable by the problem. Uh, no, it can be cacheable. Unless you mention, ask it to cache it, the problem never will. Uh, no, the thing is, well, I'm not uh, the thing is, I have a different HD access file. This is just a demo I've shown you. So I probably, I'll probably have another HD access file which will specify the cache address based on whatever that I have witnessed. So, I'm not talking about the HTTP headers. This is not about HTTP headers. I'm talking about the HTML header. Yeah, like that. Yeah, like your toolbar or your sidebar or something. That need not be fetched anymore and displayed in the main container. Still a proper HTTP header. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sorry about that. So, so another thing all these pages have is. 
they have their own bootstrap function to invoke like to like um, execute some JavaScript code at each time uh, each page is loaded. So what I do is every time I load some content, I just execute. I just check if there is a bootstrap function. I just check if there is a bootstrap function and I execute it. Go oh, ahead. Yeah. No, but the bootstrap depends on what the content you pull or the in the content I pull, depending on what each page has. Okay. So each page has its own JavaScript, right? So when executed. you pull a new page, you have to execute all the JavaScript of that page, right? So, but, so okay, but then the page doesn't have its own JS files or such, right? No, I mean all the common JS files are abstracted oh, out to all the common JS yeah. which is included anyway. Okay. This is per page. When you do a special page and it has specific JS of its own. You basically call the bootstrap function whenever it's loaded in JavaScript. So basically, JavaScript pulls the content, right. puts it in the DOM, calls the bootstrap of that own page, so it's set up the way it works. So that's why I have a bootstrap function for each page. Otherwise, also the URLs remain the same. If I just load one of these URLs in a new tab using a normal request, it just works. Because in this page also, I just include the header. And uh, it just goes about executing its because yeah because over here I have just like uh, given another check once the page loads if the bootstrap function exists it is executed and uh, since it's not loaded by Ajax I just include the header right away so that works over there and uh, I guess that's about it you can see. Just one quick thought is that I am not asking how are you checking if the bootstrap function exists now because when you load more pages, the previous bootstrap function would have already been there, right? Uh, but it gets it, it gets overwritten. Oh, another thing I do is I nullify the bootstrap before loading content. Yeah, okay, fine. Yeah, I forgot. I mentioned over here bootstrap equal to zero. I clear out the bootstrap. A new bootstrap. Otherwise, what will happen is if a new page is loaded which doesn't have a bootstrap defined and you try to invoke, it'll just Run the previous files bootstrap. So I clear out the bootstrap over here and I load the content. So uh, my developer tools just crashed again. This, uh, this is page 1, this is page 2, you can see this output where this has been uh, executed by the bootstrap function. So once you navigate and forward and backward, it just executes the bootstrap again and again. And the uh, older process is not easy to hash back, means that the hash back there's no statement by APIs. And uh, this is uh, one link which I have given with class no Ajax. In case in your application there are some links which you don't want to be loaded by Ajax for certain reasons. And uh, just an external link that just opens in a new page automatically. And uh, I'll explain about quickly. I'll explain about the fallback to hashbang URL over here. There is a plugin called jQuery.history.js. What it does is uh, so you can uh, you just pass a function to it as a argument, which uh, gets executed every time the hash value changes. So uh, you just check if uh, the content has been loaded the first time, otherwise you just load the content. And uh, over here, for the handle click state, you just uh, use dollar dot history dot go. It handles it very well. It just adds a hash before it. You have to specify the exclamation mark yourself in the link, which I just uh, added manually in the code. And if I have to, I just add it manually in the code and I just fetch it. It just handles it very simply. You just have to use uh, dollar dot history dot load of the URL, and uh, over here you just have to initialize it uh, using dollar dot history dot init. That's all it is. It's extremely simple. And 
and uh, I guess yeah, that's about it. Does anyone have any questions? How does it know when the handcuff changes? Is there an event or like they keep polling for it? Uh, they will keep polling for it okay. every uh, once in a while. Mm -hmm. I don't think they use it using events. And this whole thing is supported on mobile? Like if I support the Safari app or not? Uh, uh, yeah. And the iOS, the DSP API support actually. Yeah. Yeah. And on the Android? Uh, Android, it's all yeah, so yeah, supported. Yeah. But uh, on the phone, we actually just have a completely different mobile website. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. But otherwise, it's supported. So this works. Uh, in uh, Chrome, it works in Firefox version 4 onwards. At uh, IE9, it doesn't work. Uh, the history file, the HTML5 history API. So it falls back to hashbang URLs. Okay. So I'll show you that also. The resolution is not big enough, but They've added it in the latest version of Oprah too, as it turns out. Okay. We keep on getting these Oprah updates and I never keep it up to date. So. so I can't demonstrate the hash bank because I don't have an auto browser or anything. Right but yeah, so this works in Chrome as well. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, Chrome has support for the hashbang too, but it's not so much in Chrome. Chrome has support for the hashbang too, but it's not so much in Chrome. Chrome has support for the hashbang too, but it's not so much in Chrome. Chrome has support for the hashbang too, but it's not so much in Chrome. Chrome has but I, I'm curious about why does Twitter still not use something like this? Why does it still have like an exclamation hash and shit? Like, I'm, I don't know myself actually. Yeah, I really no. don't know why they don't know. Like a lot of things at Twitter, you don't know what they really think. <laughs> uh, even Facebook, in fact, until very, very recently, they were using hashbang hash URLs and uh, they rectified it very recently. Mm -hmm. so, See, uh, what, 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 one of the good things we realized with, the, with this system is uh, when you hit direct links, there's absolutely nothing coming in between the user and his perception that you're on some system where it's an attack store. But a direct link just work the way you expect a web page to work. It's only when the user interacts with the site and clicks more links does JavaScript begin. So there's nothing in HD access which comes in the way of URLs being read. It's everything's done on client side JavaScript. But then where does Google come into the picture in terms of indexing? Because as far as Google is concerned, you just go to the page directly and get the content, right? Correct. So Google, all the, all the sitemaps we sub publish are full URLs which yeah. anyone can pull yeah. up. So I forgot to mention that part here. In any of the links, we don't have any hash and bank published because that's just a in false the source code, okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. So all the index, all the contents are, uh, all the links don't have hash bank. So the links are easily crawlable by, uh, crawlable by Google. Once they reach the page, the content is always there, so that's also easily followed by Google. And you always have the seamless page experience, so the music always continues playing. Okay, so it's very practical, yeah. Yeah. So I do a quick run through, I have five minutes to go through this. I've done a bunch of this stuff, but I'll tell you what the basic problem is. Any of you trying to use HTML5 video or audio, um, you have to figure out what each browser supports. Um, on audio, uh, Firefox 3.6 Plus supports all in Office, Chrome supports all Office, MP3, Safari 5 Plus supports MP3 Wave. Uh, you might see there is not one single codec which is supported across the board. So you can't use one single native codec and say, I'm just going to use this file format and all the audio, audio, your simple audio controls with your source MP3 work across the board. An option to that is you can specify multiple source files. But that means re-encoding every file you have in multiple formats. And the amount of files we have, that's not practical at all, right? Uh, and uh, the, the control which you uh, which you specify in your audio tag basically comes with four, of, uh, four controls, uh, which can be accessed through JavaScript. So basically, you want an audio tag, but you don't want the default, default controls because you want to theme it your way. So they give you in JavaScript access to four functions. There's play, pause, can play, type, and buffer. Okay? So our biggest challenge was how do you take these four functions and integrate it in a seamless way in which even if there's no audio uh, HTML5 audio control available, it will still work with our flash. 
right? So we have audio uh, HTML pie as the default with a callback to Flash. So this is the simple design that we were trying to uh, uh, get across. So we designed a class called Playlist, uh, which basically gives for pie objects to anyone who controlling it in the front end. It allows you to play a file, it basically feeds a file, allows you to pause, forward, rewind and see. See is if you want to skip or mute lines. Right? And it figures out whether it's an HTML5 control or a flash control in its background. Right? Uh, so this is your simple audio ID file, which, which says the buffer is let the browser uh, like manage its own buffer. But the problem is when there is no support. Right? First we check if audio file dot length if we have some uh, some amount of the file cache. Uh, and then there is a problem where you check the file contents and figure out if this file is can be played by the audio audio tag itself, which can be played natively by the browser. Okay, and then once you figure out whether you can play it natively or not, so you can see that if you can play it natively, then you bind audio to the audio file, which is the ID of the, your audio control. Otherwise, you use the flash player control to load it. But the fun part is how do you make the flash player control work exactly like the audio control, right? Because we don't want multiple, you don't want to say this dot play dot flash player, this dot play dot pause flash player and so on. So we came up with something called the playlist, which is probably the nicest 80 lines of code I've ever written. Or another friend of mine also added it. But basically what it allows you is it allows you to bind any existing div on the browser okay, to an SWF file. So you'll see this, this is the SWF object file which basically plays the uh, MPP file if audio control is not available and has a JavaScript bridge back from the from flash into this uh, object. So whenever for instance, play happens. You get this dot pause causes this dot object dot pause, which is the SWF object which is created here. So you go around here. You there is a playlist dot id or div which we create, uh, which has the content of the flash file. Okay, and then there is a bridge setup where any play or pause comes to playlister and it figures out whether you need to push this to audio. I mean, whether this needs to be transported to flash in a, in the same way as an audio tag would. So you can see that these are the controls. So we do when the when it's ended, you get a flash control back saying that this file is ended, and then you trigger an ended onto the main JavaScript file, which will then handle it. That's exactly how the audio file audio tag also works. So this one, you can see that this <laughs> this approach also has a bunch of interesting problems. One, uh, we figured out that. If you put a flash file inside a div, you couldn't theme it because if you theme it, uh, the callbacks wouldn't work. You couldn't add any CSS property onto the div which you had an embedded flash file. So I think there was, we had a comment here somewhere uh, saying that don't do that. So we had to like embed the flash of the callback exactly on the body itself because the flash file had, if you add any CSS properties on it, it just wouldn't work. Okay, so since we're running short on time, yeah, um, let's just take questions. Any more questions? All right, thank you. Sure. But then the that, that styling thing, you know, I didn't get it. Like, so if there's any SCS styling on a div and there's a SWF file embedded in that, then there can be no callback from the SWF file back to JavaScript. You, no, the callback from the flash file to the JavaScript is not working. Okay, okay. So the flash file has a bunch of external <laughs> controls when a file ends or a file begins to play, which then calls a JavaScript bridge. Right? And the JavaScript bridge which was, was broken in that div on which you embedded the flash file had some styling. So we had to embed it on the body on the body tag itself because that's the only way it was working. Yeah, that would be hard. Embedded, the flash yeah. file interface is quite buggy actually.